Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Francis Family Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, the H&R Block Foundation, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John W. and FEE Spees Memorial Trust, Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Maris Aylward, and this is Art Supplement. We're here at the newer than ever new theater restaurant in Overland Park with more stories for you. Everything from a local company where art and heavy machinery happily coexist. To the actor who's suiting up to play King Lear in the great outdoors. Also, another edition of My Favorite Fountain, and a famous filmmaker, too. It's all ahead on The Upload. There are certain names that always come to mind when you think about growing the arts in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Kemper, Block, Hall, Hellsberg. And to that list, we should be adding Belger. Well, you know, it's a name you've probably seen attached to cranes or large trucks. Their cartage company has been around since 1919. But what began with an art gallery in the company headquarters has spawned a Red Star ceramic studio and now another amazing complex called the Crane Yard Studio. What Dick and Evelyn Craft Belger are quietly building here is definitely worth further examination. Boston, Massachusetts, Melbourne, Australia, Phoenix, Arizona, Tijuana, Mexico, Austin, Texas, Greenville, South Carolina, and on and on. Yeah, the way I remember it was Dick said, I've been going to museums for 30 years, and half the time I get in my car and I think, what the was that all about? He said, all I want you to do is hang out and talk to people. And then we have this mysterious three-dimensional and explain to them why I collect what I collect and why we do the shows we do. And I've found that's been a pretty successful formula. Ten years have passed now since Mo Dickens took the reins of the gallery started by the late Myra Morgan a few years earlier. Myra also gets credit for starting Dick Belger on his art collecting odyssey a few decades before that. Turns out he'd already had some practice. I think I've collected about everything except bottle caps and baseball cards. If you collect, you're learning. If you're learning, you're still alive. If you're not learning, you're dead. For a guy who claims he could barely spell art when he started, Dick caught on quickly amassing works by top-flight contemporary artists like William Wiley, Jasper Johns, Robert Stackhouse, and William Christenberry, among others. Works which soon began finding their way onto walls in the company headquarters. I have a real curiosity, and I discovered later I'm a fan of process. You know, how do you get from here to there? What happens in that? And that's what those artists are doing. They're processing. They're going through a process to do that work and they're resolving some of their own issues, some of their personal issues, and that's really what got me hooked in art. I need to get it up to get The it Belger up. collection runs so deep on certain artists that Mo and his staff frequently field calls from high-profile museums around the country putting together exhibitions of their own. In fact, Evelyn Kraft Belger met her future husband while serving as executive director of the Arts Center in St. Petersburg, Florida. They've been married six years now. I respect and love the collection, and I love Dick's collecting vision. I would probably buy things in an undisciplined manner because I love them. I love seeing people try new things, develop new skills, and hopefully grow as an artist. So far, Evelyn's biggest impact, aside from helping Dick dial down his work week to just six days, can be found a few blocks further east across the railroad tracks from the real crane yard. The Belger Crane Yard Studios at 20th and Tracy contain a little bit of everything. An exhibition space, a new home for Red Star Ceramics, the Lawrence Lithography Workshop, and the metal shop where Ashir Akram built his acclaimed Pakistani cargo truck. I believe it's really important to 
provide an opportunity to, to as many people as possible to experience the creative process. If you're in a museum environment, you have so many other restrictions. Um, when you are in an art center environment like ours, which is a private gallery, we can take a lot more chances because we're, what we're doing is trying to educate about the creative process and that includes mistakes and it includes opportunities for people to soar you know, that they wouldn't have had before. When I still had the shop in Lawrence, some of the artists that he was collecting like Stackhouse and Wiley and those guys, they were sending over to me to print with. And he wanted the idea of a shop here in this area instead of just on the east or west coast. After spending some time in Texas, Mike Sims brought his printmaking prowess back to town. In 2001, Lawrence Lithography became the first and for many years only occupant of this formidable old building that once housed a wax paper plant. I like, personally, that we're not right down in the Crossroads District. I like that this has its own little niche. The view of these windows every single day is stimulating, and you know, the weather changes. The show out the window is great. Now the Red Star is downstairs and with the uh, metal shop. All of this is now becoming an arts destination point, so we're all feeding off each other this way. We're getting a critical mass here that's really bringing people out. There are facilities that strive to do similar things uh, in town, like there's the Hobbs building and there was the Arts Incubator. But I think the way they're approaching setting everything up and letting it kind of organically define itself is unique here and it's working really well. Nothing as ambitious as the cargo truck has passed through here lately, but plenty of metal fabrication continues. In fact, Ashir showed some large-scale pieces upstairs last winter. And in the spirit of things, he's also been playing more frequently with ceramics. Which brings us to Crane Yard Clay, a wholesale operation housed in the east end of the complex. Selling art supplies for pottery making has deepened the revenue stream here, and that's by design. My background is in business first, and then it was the arts. And um, even though it was the business side of the arts later on, I think you've got to have both elements. It can't be all wishful thinking. There's a lot of hard work into any career in the arts. And that creative process not only works in the arts, it also works in the business. Because you have to be quick on your feet and be able to adapt new ways of thinking in the business world to be successful. And that's one good influence that the arts have on me is my feet aren't quite planted so deep in cement. You know, I can move a little bit quicker. As unusual as this mix might seem, consider this. The heavy hauling industry moves things from point A to point B not unlike the artistic process that Dick Belger finds so fascinating. I think his biggest contribution to the city, and he makes a whole lot of incredible contributions to the city, but is the backing he gives the arts at the ground level, building up. I won't say we're reclusive, but we're pretty private people. The only reason to put our name on anything is to say that it's important that everybody give whatever level that you can do something that um, opens another person's eyes to the arts or creative process, that's really important. So this is very early, and this is kind of funny to me because I found... Students from the Art Institute frequently come down here and they say, how do I get a job like yours, Mo? And I you know, learned pretty early on the correct answer was, I don't think there is a job like mine. If I ever hear of one, I'll let you know. Come here, I gotta show you the way Peregrine signed this thing. New Year's Day, 2001. Look, get close, look how she signed it. She's looking forward and looking back. When you come to the new theater, you get treated really well. Cushy seats, climate control, and a menu that's come a long way since the old days of dinner theater. It is a little different than the experience you'd expect when you head off to the Heart of America Shakespeare Festival, <laughs> where conditions are, shall we say, more variable. 
This year, the chosen play is King Lear, and it's underway in Southmoreland Park through July 5th. John Rinson House is the actor chosen to wear those heavy robes and carry all that inner rage. We got a chance to speak with this veteran of many such productions on the stone wall at Park's Edge. Away by Jupiter! This will be my sixth time to be in the play, uh, but this will be my first time to, uh, to be playing the titular character, King Lear. So back in February, I started growing my beard and not cutting my hair and letting it all go wild. And this is what we get. And, and uh, I tell people, you should come to the park this summer. We're doing King Lear. And they said, you look like King Lear. And I'm like, well, OK. Halfway there. I take Cordelia by the hand, Duchess of Burgundy. Nothing. I have sworn I'm firm. Sidney Garrett, the executive artistic director of the festival, uh, has pulled together a pretty consistent company uh, that she uses, and this year is no different. Uh, Mark Robbins is in the play, uh, Matt Rapport, Cinnamon Schultz, uh, Kim Martin Cotton, who uh, I got to play with. We were Mr. and Mrs. Macbeth together, and we were uh, Antony and Cleopatra together uh, maybe three years ago. She is now my daughter. That is how I have aged. She used to be my girlfriend, now she's my daughter. Her husband, Jacques Roy, who played a very memorable puck in Midsummer Night's Dream a couple years ago, he's in this. We're a group that uh, has really uh, gotten to bond over the various summers uh, out here. Rain and heat and humidity will tend to make you bond with those you are around at that time. <laughs> if I gave them all, when we did it 15 years ago, it was much more uh, civilized. We were wearing tuxedos in the first scene, so it was the crumbling of the civilized society. Here, I think it's more the full realization of a more savage society that uh, when allowed to eat each other up, we eat each other up. Sidney Garrett loves Game of Thrones, and so this is sort of in a uh, Middle Ages. It's a barbaric play, so, it, you know, it's a good choice. You slave, you cur! I am none of these, my lord, I beseech your heart. Do you bandy looks with me, you rat? Oh. 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 King Lear wasn't done much um, throughout the years because of, just because of the nihilistic worldview that it offers. At the end of World War II, it started being done a lot more because we had all seen the horrors of the war. Oftentimes people say, well, King Lear is, is the Shakespeare play for our age, <laughs> which doesn't say much about our age. So it follows that I am rough, lecherous. <laughs> There's a classic sequence where he goes out into the storm. He, he's sort of driven mad and goes out onto the heath in the middle of a storm and he gets to say the famous blow winds and crack your cheeks rage blow and that's that's fun to say and that's fun to fully embody and uh, I, I now understand why the character does it because there's something liberating you just go ah bring it on I can take it that's a really fun part to do <laughs> Under fire. I love it out here. I love it because in the open air, it's difficult when the play starts at 8 o'clock because it's not dark yet. And you can see the people very clearly. You can see them eating their fried chicken and drinking their wine and makes you want to be on that side of the fence with them. It, make, it makes me uh, actually very nervous when to, to see the audience in broad daylight. So for the first scene is usually a little nerve wracking. Uh, I won't lie about that. But once you get going, uh, you get into the flow of the play and everything, and, and the audience sort of drifts away. And then once it gets dark, it becomes magical. You've lost me in your life, you that's not been born, then not to have pleased me. <laughs> and yeah, and you do have to get yourself mentally prepared to just, okay, I'm going to be a sweaty mess. There are flies may fly into my mouth while I'm talking. That happens regularly. You choke on these flies, you know. And then uh, every night, though, is the great thing why I love being out here. Every, every performance, when you get to the end and it's cooled off a bit and the pretty lights are shining and you get to the end of the play, uh, it's, it's a glorious thing. And, and it's worth it. It's worth it. Definitely. Do not make me mad.
And John Rensenhaus, without the beard, will be on stage as Mr. Kirby when the new theater restaurant does You Can't Take It With You this fall. The show on stage right now is Hairspray, which unlike many of the productions here, doesn't have a big name out front. Over the years, Richard Carruthers and Dennis Tennessee have found great success mixing big names like Barbara Eden, Gary Sandy, Marion Ross with some of the great acting talent we have here in town already. Another thing we have here in the Metro are fountains. Lots of them. Their artistry speaks to the things we value as a city, but sometimes they can become very personal as well. On this edition of My Favorite Fountain, we head up North Oak with producer Dave Burkhart for a touching tribute at the Children's Fountain. This fountain, the Children's Fountain in Children's Fountain Park, north of Kansas City, is our favorite fountain. And the story of why uh, begins with the birth and death of our daughter, Milena, uh, who was born in July of 2013. It's a fountain about children. It's a, um, it's a beautiful little park, even though we're surrounded here by very busy streets. Even though Milena uh, was a girl, the, the sculpture that I actually most grab onto here is of the little boy um, who's holding his crutches in the air. And it, it really just immediately demonstrated for me um, a limitlessness, um, leaving behind all the cares of the body and being free. And, and when I see it, I, I think of her running and playing. I, I know for me, I, I think of all of the ages that we hope to, to raise her through and to, to get to watch her grow through. And the, the first sculpture seems to be the youngest and she's just dipping her toe into the water. But you know, at the other end, there's uh, the sculpture who's almost you know, a, a full adult and is not looking back, is looking, looking over her shoulder a little bit, but, but mostly uh, just has her arms up and, and all of the documentation that I've seen about the fountain refers to her as Joy, uh, which I think is, is just a wonderful touch. This park has opportunity to memorialize uh, people who passed on bricks, benches. We chose a tree. And the tree is a redbud over there with a plaque in her honor. It's going to be a true pleasure to, to watch it grow over the years, um, to see it change during different seasons. It's got beautiful bright pink flowers. It, it means a great deal to us for other people to be able to remember her with us. Here on Arts Upload, we like to say that we're proving Kansas City is America's creative crossroads. We also share certain stories that come to us from the outside world. Uh, and this next one lets me say David Lynch was on our show. <laughs> As you may have heard, Twin Peaks is set to return in 2016. But before Mr. Lynch made movies, the renowned director found a creative outlet in other forms. Take a look. The traces of Philadelphia in his work are you can't you can't unwind or pull anything apart without Philadelphia um, poking up. I haven't seen some of these paintings um, that are in the show since the '60s. When I went around uh, looking at the show upstairs, I got um, more. I got ideas. So I think it's good to look back sometimes. say Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is my biggest influence. There is something about the mood here. There was dark carved wood banisters and stairways. There was a certain type of green that they would paint the rooms, either white or this strange green. The rooms had nice proportions. So there was a certain kind of purity. It hadn't been disturbed except by the soot. It wasn't any one particular thing or scene that you witnessed here. It was the mood and it's what some of the images did when they got down inside of you. Yeah, Philadelphia is a, uh, percolating in me. The Unified Field is the first museum exhibition of David Lynch's paintings and drawings uh, ever. It's the largest uh, 
survey that's ever been on view in an American museum, and it's the first. Back in 1965, and I want to... He's also an internationally known film director, and writer, and he has been nominated for Academy Awards, pretty much a celebrity. He's known throughout the entire world as a film director, but David Lynch is at heart a painter. I only wanted to be a painter. I got into film by accident in this very building, in one of the studios right over here. The first film I ever made is now being shown here as it was um, when I made it. And it was projected in this room, almost just to the right of where you're sitting on a 16 millimeter projector. And then I had a tape recorder with a loop of siren and it was played right here. One of the things I'm most proud of about this exhibition is that we are presenting Six Men Getting Sick, which Lynch did in 1967 for the first time since 1967. Where David Lynch begins, to me, as somebody who's making work that is uniquely his own, is with Six Men Getting Sick. It's that piece that he made as his entry um, into the second annual um, experimental painting and sculpture competition that was held at PAFA. Lynch, uh, who is an advanced painting student uh, at PAFA, uh, didn't produce a painting, but based on an experience he had in his studio one night, he was painting an image of green garden plants at night. It was a nocturnal scene. He paused, and then from the painting came a wind that he heard and he felt. And then he saw the plants start to move on the canvas, and he thought, oh, a moving painting. And he stresses that he wasn't on drugs. You know, this is the late 60s, and everybody wants to know, was David Lynch taking drugs? But all of his friends, and he sort of asserts that he was as pretty much straight as an arrow. Not having had any film training whatsoever, there was no film program at PAFA, there wasn't even a photography curriculum at PAFA. He and his friend Bruce Samuelson, who teaches here now, um, uh, has been teaching here since the early 70s and was a classmate of Lynch's, talked about getting cameras together and starting some kind of film experiments. Well, Lynch went and bought a camera, uh, a wind-up camera, and he started to basically do stop-motion animation of a painting he was making. Six Men Getting Sick isn't the moment where there's a crossroads and David Lynch picks film over painting or drawing. It is the first manifestation of what winds up being a total, total sensory immersion. When you look at what the result is, Six Men Getting Sick, it's a, a filmed animation that goes on for 60 seconds and it's looped, aimed at a sculpted screen that's six by eight feet. And the animation is basically a painting that he's making, that he gradually adds to, shoots two frames, adds to it, shoots two frames, and continues to do that. And so, He's not making little sort of animated cells or approaching film in the way a filmmaker would. Lynch is approaching film the way he knows how to do any kind of studio work or come up with a solution. He is actually making a painting and filming it as it is transforming uh, you know, through his gradual additive process. And I've been painting ever since, and, uh, but I uh, get something from painting that I don't get from any other medium, for sure. If you don't know what it is, a sore can be very beautiful. A sore in the skin, an infection, a deep cut with pus, but if you took a picture of it, a close-up, and you didn't know exactly what it was, it could be a great uh, beauty of organic phenomenon. But he's constantly trying to think of new ways of realizing that idea. And it's a vision of total sensory immersion rather than, Ed, I am choosing film over painting. It's all together. I only wanted to be a painter. Painting led to wanting to do a moving painting with sound. So. Cinema, to me, is sound and picture moving together in time. And for me, it was born out of painting. 
Eraserhead is also this intuitive process that he is making a film in a manner that takes four years, um, partly because of funding, but also because of the nature of the way he's constructing the world, constructed and added to in the way that somebody working in a studio, doing something, putting something in juxtaposition, adding something to it, would do a film, rather than somebody who's shooting a narrative that has a linear sort of trajectory. He wants to constantly remind people that it's a muse. Philadelphia has been his muse, basically. The, the incredible new look at the new theater restaurant was just unveiled a few months earlier this spring. But you know, what's really amazing to me is that it has been almost 23 years since they closed down Tiffany's attic and moved out here to 92nd and Foster. Also amazing, we are out of time once again. But not to worry, next week more stories, including, and I will only say this once, toitisserie. Plus some graffiti for a good cause. It's all coming up on the next Arts Upload. No more. These are unsightly tricks. Return you to my sister. Never, Regan. She has a fantasy of half my train. Looked black upon me. Struck me with her tongue most serpent-like upon the very heart. Will the stored vengeance of heaven fall on her ingrateful top? <laughs> Strike her young bones, you taking airs with lameness! Why? <laughs> Dart your gnome, you nimble lightning. Dart your blinding flames into her scornful eyes. Infect her beauty, you fence-hawk fogs, to fall and blister! Oh, the blessed God! So shall you wish... Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Francis Family Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, the H&R Block Foundation, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John W. and F.E.E. Spees Memorial Trust, Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.